Welcome back to the MTR Network. I'm the doctor here with Herosia, here to give you the last three episodes of season three of 12 Monkeys, where we get to know the witness a little better and discover that it was a big old size and that the witness wasn't even the important person in this whole thing, or at least not the witness we thought. <laughs> but before we started, right before we got on the air, we and, you know, rest in peace, Adam West, the original television Batman. He passed away to either last night or early this morning at the age of 88 of leukemia, which, you know, 88 is a lot of years, but it still, it still hurts to see your childhood phase pass on and transition. So we just want to take the time to say rest in peace, Adam, you know, hopefully he's no longer in any pain, but it's still sad to see. And also Glenn Hetty for, I don't know how many people know Glenn Headley. She is a character actor. She was Riz's original lawyer uh, on the night of, I'm sorry, Nas, Riz Ahmed is the actor. <laughs> she played his original lawyer on the night of, and she's a character actor that's been on ER and Mr. Holland's Opus and a ton of other films, but she also passed away of unknown causes. She was only 63. So, you know, much thoughts to their families and to those of fans of theirs who are hurting today. But did you have something you wanted to say? Or? <laughs> um, I just, you know, the Adam West thing just threw, threw me for a loop because kind of like him and, you know, the recent passing of Roger Moore, he seemed like very active. Like he was oh, always yeah. out there. And, and, can, and, and yeah. Yeah, like, he, you know, he did a lot of voice work for the different Lego oh, movies and the Lego Batman movies and the Legos. I uh, just DC movie, DC games, not movies, Lego DC games and it's just like wow so we have his voice in so many places and his okay. imprint in so many places and but there'll be no new things from him and that's selfish to think of I'm sure his family even if he didn't do those things would still want him here but mm -hmm. yeah just cancer sucks mm. indeed mm. indeed so Last, so where do you want to begin? <laughs> last arc. Let's start with the fact that I love James Callis. He played yeah. um, The Witness or Ethan. Uh, James Callis, many of you will recognize him as Gaius Baltar from the Battlestar Galactica uh, television show, the, the new series. Um, he also was, I want to say he was in one of the Arrow, Arrowverse, um, Flareverse. He guessed it as one of those villains on one of yes. those shows. He, he guessed as the Artful Dodger. Okay. I where mean. he had like the bombs and he was a thief. And he was also on another sci-fi show, uh, the last two seasons of Eureka. That's right. Oh, how could I have forgotten that? I love Eureka. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so he, you know, he, I just, I don't know what it is about him. He just, he takes whatever role you give him and he just, he makes it enjoyable. He makes it extremely enjoyable, and he has a, a bit of gravitas, if you will, yeah. uh, to the role. And he played it so well. He played, like, the emotions of Ethan as um, this melancholy, like, kind of resigned but fighting his state kind of a person mm -hmm. to someone who's befuddled by humanity because every person he looks at, he knows exactly how their life is going to end until he met the love of his life and then following in love and then that loss and that pain and that anger and that despair, just that gamut of emotions in like three episodes. It was just, it was just, it was just great acting on his part. Mm -hmm. I have to say that, you know, I appreciate Sebastian doing what he could. I understood why he went his separate way from Sebastian. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, the, the idea that everyone you, interact with you know exactly how they die and when it's going to happen that's just a lot to have to to stomach and to deal with so I get needing that psychic separation just for your own sanity's sake excuse me I guess I just did not buy that of all the people you know yes he fell in love with this woman but Sebastian um for the most part you, you know Sebastian raised him Yes. And so the idea that he sees this man's death, and that's not the catalyst to stop time, but romantic love is, I just, that didn't work for me. <laughs> it did not work. Oh, I, it was beautifully, it was beautifully acted. 
I love the actress who was playing his love. I, I love the acting. The acting in all three arcs was excellent. I didn't like the story that they were given to tell. I, you know, I agree to, to some extent. I think what it is, because we're dealing with a, a time traveling show, is I think he experienced in his timeline, Ethan's, the death of that woman uh, before he got to the death of Sebastian. And maybe Sebastian's death would have been the catalyst for him, but it was the woman's death, the, the love of his life that was the catalyst. And he was more angered by the fact that Sebastian passed and he thought maybe he could bring him back like he tried to bring the love of his life back, you know, almost, what was it, like 624 Six. times he tried to try to bring her back? Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess that's my question, and that's where it got a little confusing for me. Did he leave Sebastian before he met this woman or after? Because the way this story was told, I got the impression he left Sebastian's side before he met this woman. He did it before, and I think he was just traveling to try to avoid fate, if you will. He was, like, doing all these random jumps to go all these different times to avoid to try to not be that, uh, as he put it, that cold calculating demon at the end of the, the road. So he was just jumping around trying to avoid his fate, if you will, this, this fate that he's been raised to do. And so avoiding everything and avoiding everyone and avoiding connections. And then when he made that connection and got tethered to that one point in time, that's when I think he really started experiencing all the human emotions, really, and, and feeling being part of the human experience, and then he got crushed by it. And that's when he decided he wanted to be the witness and be that demon and have the Red Forest and change everything and ha bring all that happiness, what he perceived to be happiness, into his life. You know what's sad about this? I get it. Mm -hmm. And as a standalone, it works for me. As a part of this series, it doesn't. I don't know if that makes sense. Because everything that's come before this has just been all over the place and not well explained, not well executed. And then you have this arc that is beautifully written to a certain degree because there are, I do have issues, especially with the end. It did not stick the landing. I know you said it stick the, stuck the landing for you. It did not stick the landing for me at all. Okay. It just felt like it was thrown in so that they could get some more seasons out of the show and I did not appreciate it at all. Um, but looking at as a standalone, these last three episodes, as a standalone into the series, minus that ending, worked for me. But everything leading up to it does not. It just doesn't. Yeah, like I like I said at the the last review, like I well, I feel like the ending the ending did stick. Like the journey to here was very wonky. There was parts that worked and parts that didn't work. And I guess they thought the ending was going to make everything tie together, and it doesn't quite tie everything together at all and no and given the fact they had 10 episodes and the budget looks good and the acting you know is very well done by everybody involved it just it seems like the writers i'm like we stated earlier they they were just a little sloppy with their storytelling and kind of ignoring their their uh rules which kind of hampered or dragged down this season and then the fact that you know we've been tracking this witness for three years and mm -hmm. You know, it was interesting that, you know, it made sense that the witness was a primary, right? But yes. Then, but then to end it and say, oh, no, he's a witness. The witness was actually Olivia. It's like, excuse me? What? I, I, do you want to get into that or do you want to talk about other stuff? Let's, let's get that out of the way because otherwise it's going to sit here and prickle at me. <laughs> let's just get that out of the way and then we get to the other stuff. I'm just okay. like, there is nothing in three years not to say that people have to be led by their noses to a conclusion, but it just felt so cheap and just thrown in there just to be thrown in there. It really did. Okay. For the overall C series arc, yes. For the season, there were hints in the season that kind of hinted to that possibly Olivia, if you look back like a second viewing, you can see they were leading up to it, but they were very subtle. Like the fact that she let them know especially Cassie and Cole, that she was the child in the box and she got left behind and she blamed them. And then she said uh, something to um, Jones, how he uh, Cole always gets, gets sent out there and creates the problems that he has to fix. And one of those problems is Olivia. 
And then there was that uh, time where Jennifer, uh, when she was stuck in France, and she does that play where she's doing the splinter play, and she's, you know, Jennifer's the hero, or she's the goddess of time, and she ends up killing the witness. I, I think it ties together if you just look at the Jennifer and Olivia arc, even through the series, because the two of them have been so tied together um, in a sense that, you know, Olivia is the one that kind of shaped Jennifer to be somewhat the person that she is, and Jennifer is responsible for basically destroying Olivia's faith in the witness. And so I think that's what they were trying to go for. Uh, I can see how series-wise it doesn't quite fit, but for the, this, this particular season arc, the little hints that they had, it does fit. It does, but that goes back to the writing being, I'm just going to say, it was shitty. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. you, you set up this whole thing in the first two seasons, and then you completely went left and just pulled stuff out that made no sense in terms of the story arc you had been telling. It just didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Well, th- that's true, and I can see it that way. But I also kind of like just as a, if they had built it better. It's a great story idea because this is something that I kind of wish they had done. I'm going to bring up a different franchise, like the Terminator story, because you remember the first Terminator mm-hmm. where the Terminator had to find all the Sarah Connors because he didn't know which Sarah Connor it was. Right. So he went through the phone book. Mm-hmm. And I always thought, why couldn't they have done that to John Connor? Why couldn't you know, you trick Skynet because Skynet's a machine, it has data, it has input and information, but it doesn't have that cognitive human ability to distinguish things. Where you have like a kind of Spartacus type of deal where everyone is John Connor, so you have no idea who the true John Connor is. But then you send up a bunch of people to be yeah. murdered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have a bunch of people that could, you know, be, and you have no idea who the singular John Connor is, or it could have been a collective, you know, it could have been a code name, mm-hmm. something like that. And it seems like this is kind of what they did here, where, uh, as Ethan said, you know, my creation beget your your ability to be created, where you had no idea that there was really another witness, if you will. Yeah. That there was the true witness. And I think if they had built it up better throughout the series, then it would make sense because Olivia has been part of the show from the very beginning. Right. No, I I will agree with you there. I'm just going off of what they gave us. What they gave us, it doesn't work. But you're right. They could have built this from the beginning, but look, the folks over at Agent, the Whedon family, Joss and now Jed with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they have spoiled me with Mm -hmm. the way they purposely craft their stories like seasons out. Yeah. So, so with Buffy, at season three, he told you at the end of season three that Buffy was dying in season five, but people didn't recognize that's what he was telling you. Yes, and you, you know? have to, it takes me maybe three or four, four, four watchings to finally see what people were talking about. Mm-hmm. Because I, you get so enamored with all the other things. Or even just, you know, the recent show, uh, the Whedon show of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., how mm-hmm. everything is built off of that first season that no one really liked. But you can't get everything else without that that foundational layer. Yeah. And and so and I think purposeful. Yeah, go ahead. You know, purposeful writing, like I'm watching American Gods and how purposeful that writing is. You know, Westworld, how purposeful that was. You just, I just. You know what? You know what? It as I thought about. Um, did you watch Sleepy Hollow at all? I watched the first. And I got through half of the second season. Okay, so the first season, okay, for me, the first season was perfection. It was so well done. It was tight. And then the second season stumbled a bit. They threw Katrina in our faces, and we really didn't give two shits about Katrina. But, you know, we tolerated her because Abby and Ichabod had this destiny ahead of them. Yes. It was third season, I think I stopped. That's when they brought in a whole bunch of folks that no one gave two shits about. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then but the, I like that actress. Yeah, I and know. she did what she did the role, but that was it wasn't her. It was the writing. It was the writing. And then the third season, they decided, oh, Abby's not that important anyway, so we're just going to kill her and pretend it was really all about Ichabod, except that that's not what you wrote in season one. And then no. after the fourth season, it got canceled. That's what I'm watching happen with <laughs> 12 Monkeys. You started off really strong with season one. You kind of skipped, you stumbled a bit here and there too, but you kind of stuck the landing. And then season three was like, 
<laughs> because it did not connect with what you set up in the beginning with your mythology. And I'm like, don't do this. Y'all got to stop. Y'all got to stop being lazy with these shows because it feels like laziness towards the purpose of getting more seasons. And I'm like, it's okay if you say, I set this up as a one season mini series special event or I set this up to be exactly three seasons that is all you're getting that is all I'm committed to and this is the story I'm going to tell see that that's a good thing because there's a few shows that were like that I think it was like Babylon 5 was like the first mm -hmm. really true planned out television show mm -hmm. and then other television shows did that and like Supernatural like when it first started out was only planned to be five seasons and it was and if you those all, first five seasons yeah. were perfect, and now yes, they're and in season all, twelve, and it's yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yes, I don't get me long. I love my Winchesters. Yes. I kind of dropped out after like season ten and a little bit of eleven. That's where I kind of done. But I would highly recommend to people to watch the first five seasons mm -hmm. because it is extremely well planned out, and that ending, even though they had a little tag in it, it was a perfect ending for the. For that series, yeah. And when shows are done like that, is is great. I think even to a point, even um, you know, Twin Peaks is back on. I haven't seen the new stuff, but the old stuff, mm -hmm. there was a planned out, but it was really like planned out for one season because it was so experimental mm -hmm. that David Lynch and crew didn't know they were going to get anything further. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see where second season in the movie where things get a little wonky or whatever, but it's still. Is still enriching and, and just because of the caliber of the acting and the writing and what's going on, even though the story's a little wonky. I think what's happening here is they did have some kind of a purpose and they knew they were out of first season, nice mini event, maybe a second one. But after that, they didn't really plan too far, far out because, I don't know, sci-fi wasn't giving them a good enough signals or what the deal was. And I'm I'm curious of when they realized they were gonna get the fourth and the fifth season because maybe that's when the shift of the writing happened because it seems like something happened where things got shifted around. Fourth, but um, and just as an FYI, I know you said you read somewhere, but I, every place I've read and even the season finale here said there's only four seasons. There's only one more season after this. Um, I mean, you okay. can, but on the Sci-Fi Channel, they said season four is the final season. Oh. All right, well, maybe I misread somewhere. Well, it might have been yeah. that the fans thought that they had enough for a fifth season, but however many episodes they have are going to be stuffed mm -hmm. into a fourth season. So I don't know if they're going to do the drop like they did this year and just drop them all on the weekend, that same one mm -hmm. weekend. But Okay. Well, what I do think is going into season four, they, it, they do seem to have a clear plan. Yeah. I think the whole Olivia Jennifer battle, because I think that's what they're building up to. I think that would be a very interesting battle because how often do you see really strong, clear, well-written female characters going after each other for a purposeful reason, where it's not like a man or a love story or something like that, but these are women that have their own agency and have their own purpose, and one is the hero, one is the villain. Yeah, and I think that would be very interesting if they can still keep those characters as well rounded as well written as they have been that's true um and i that, that's what would really fascinate me and that's why i thought that personally for me the landing s stuck for me because i thought oh that's very interesting where they shifted everything away from cole and cassie and the witness and back onto jennifer as being the really the most important primary which has been hinted out throughout the series. Now, I will but agree now, with that. I will agree that she's been the center point in terms of primaries. Mm hmm And she's getting that affirmation from Ethan saying that she's the best out of all of them. Mm hmm So, and then I have no idea, like, what the... I kind of know what the um, the snake symbol is, but as far as the, what they're going to do with the mythos here, I have no idea what that is going to be, and... Or how, I guess, Cole's mother's going to come back again somehow in the next season. But I just personally, I just kind of like how that ended, just how it would be Jennifer versus Olivia. The other stuff, eh, like I said, the journey wasn't the best getting here to that point. No. Um, Jennifer, 
Yeah. Shall we discuss her since we, that's a good segue? Uh, yeah. So it turns out Deacon just did not matter. <laughs> you poor Deacon. Because he thought he was the dying man in the photo, and it turns out, like, no, nah, dude, you're not even that. <laughs> you know, I do think he does matter because Olivia has made him to matter. He didn't matter. Deacon didn't matter to the witness. That's why he wasn't on the map mm -hmm. because he matters to the real witness, to Olivia. Because he was the one that got Olivia into the place the first time with the messengers. Mm -hmm. And then when she beat the crap out of everybody with her superhuman superpowers, she let Deacon live and said that, you know, he could be so much more and he allowed these people to make him weak. And right. that she can make him better. Right. I think so going I, I think going forward yeah. he's gonna have a role. It's just that up yeah. to this point he was just, you know, he could have just been the UPS guy for all we know. You know, <laughs> I'm just delivering the packages. I'm just delivering the keys, opening the doors. Yeah, and he, that sort of irritated and graded him, and he kind of took it out on everybody, especially Jennifer, mm -hmm. until he, I guess you might say he had an epiphany where he realized that, you know, he, he can't keep doing this. And he let Jennifer go, and then he realized Jennifer tricked him. And he had a smile on his face. <laughs> he's one of those people where he, he likes it when, you know, people stand up to him and show them show him up, or if, if you will, he's proud of that. That's like a, I don't know, his proud papa moment for him. Yeah, basically. And, <laughs> yeah. The way Jennifer tricked and she like winked at him, and they have like a really good dynamic, so the, the two characters and the two actors, they have great chemistry to each other, but uh, again, Jennifer shines throughout these last, this, the whole entire arc, even though she wasn't really the center of it until maybe like the last episode. She wasn't the center, but she was a thread. I feel like she, she was, was a thread was. throughout it. She was, especially with the pictures and the painting and her and Olivia switching places where Jennifer's in the case and Olivia's on the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's like everything Jennifer was saying leading up to it is like, she's here for a purpose. Don't trust her. Don't trust her. Don't trust her. And it seemed obvious to me, even though I had no idea what the ending was going to be when I saw that moment, it was like, yeah, you guys need to listen to to, to the crazy person here because Olivia's not supposed to be on the outside of that case. And what are you guys doing? It sounds like you're bumping up against your mic a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that they are doing? You know, they're stabbing each other, they're shooting at each other, they're locking each other up. It seems like everything is falling apart because of their obsession to kill the witness. And even Hannah got caught up into it because for a while there in the earlier episodes, Hannah seemed to be the more humanitarian person. And then she kind of switched. And I don't, they didn't really explain that switching moment to where she kind of started going along with her mother with this whole vengeance plan and killing people. Well, here's the thing. Hannah has always been a warrior. But I don't mm -hmm. think Hannah appreciated her mother treating her like, an assassin or a tool the way she was, which was where that, I think that pushback was coming from. Mm -hmm. Or expendable. Yeah. And she said, even she, though I don't think Jones, Katarina saw her daughter as expendable. It was coming across. That's how she was being treated was as, ex, as an expendable asset. Mm -hmm. Well, I was referring to um, the moment where they're in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jones was going to shoot Ethan, and she she says she's sorry to Hannah because she knew it's the moment she shot Ethan that it's possibility that Cassie or Cole was going to shoot Hannah. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I meant. But oh, okay. maybe you're right. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, hmm. No, I don't think she was mad at her mom about that because I when, when what wasn't it when she was a baby she was saying it's okay like. The whole life, I think Hannah understands that, you know, my life can't matter more than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there are moments throughout the season where Hannah was like, you know, we can't be torturing Olivia. We can't be, like, going after each other when she's trying to get Cole in the first episode to come back from being so dark and so obsessive and finding Cassie. Like, she seemed to be really one of the very few voices of reason to where we shouldn't be treating each other this way. This is not the path. 
And then it seemed like the last three episodes, there was like a switch to where, as they're tracking and chasing down Cassie and Cole, where she's all for taking them out and taking out the witness and not maybe pausing for a moment and saying, well, can we save the witness? Well, I mean, and sure, yeah. that that goes back to the writing issues. That goes yeah. back to the writing issues that we're having in terms of mm-hmm. they're not pro- properly explaining character motivations. There was no reason for her to become a murderess. We, okay, some of the audience, not me, got why, Cater- I get why, okay, I personally get why Deacon was pissed. Mm-hmm. It was ready to just say, you know, fuck it. They got, if they get in the way of killing the witness, then they got to die too. Because that's who Deacon is. That's who Deacon has been written to be. That I get. Mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily agree with Katarina's turn in that same direction, but that's how they wanted to write it. Okay. Hannah's switch made no sense. There was nothing in her mm-hmm. character that made sense that she would turn on these people like that and say that this is an acceptable outcome. Because for yeah. so long, she had been the voice of reason in terms of how they were approaching things with her mom. Yes, and she was very Jennifer like that because Jennifer's been consistently like, no, this is not how we're supposed to do things. This is not the right way. Letting Olivia out, torturing Olivia, going after Cassie and Cole and her kind of delaying trying to find them and hiding the whole word in the map witness stuff. Uh, She kind of gets that, you can see that influence from Jennifer and Hannah, and that was great because it shows that the person who raised her should probably be more like that than um, her mother, whom she barely remembered. Mm-hmm. But that switch wasn't, it wasn't really properly explained. It really wasn't. And I know she got shot at the house and she got hit and she almost died. But even that, what I wouldn't think would be enough of a shift for her to be like, let's go get them. To me personally, from what they have built up of Hannah in the last two seasons. No, and that's true. That is true. And now Deacon going full on, let's get him. You, you know, that is within character of him. Mm-hmm. And I did like the fact that I, I'm curious to how exactly how old Deacon's character was when the plague hit. Because he clearly was way older than Cole and Ramsey because he knew a lot of pop culture stuff. But way younger than whatever age uh Cassie was because he was dressed as a pirate mm-hmm. in the the mask ball thing. I thought that was just very amusing. So he was dressed as like the bad guy, if you will. Mm-hmm. And he must have deliberately picked that because there's a few. Because now he's a time traveler. There's a few costume things that he's done. Like when he was in the '80s, he was dressed up like Miami Vice, if you will, mm-hmm. or the references that he makes. And I was just I'd be curious if they ever get into that or flashback to uh, next season to a uh, who however old Deacon was. I don't but know I that we, that but yeah. I don't know that that's relevant to the story, truthfully. I don't I don't want us to get uh-huh. into season four and have a bunch of bullshit filler episodes again. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just okay. settled with thinking that he was easily about ten years older than Cole and left it at that, truthfully. Mm-hmm. But I just I thought that it was just a very amusing his costume choice, if you will. And he kind of was kind of like really evil going after them, hunting them through the house, if you will. And then I guess he's he and uh, Katarina were responsible for killing the uh, Sebastian. Um, yeah. Oh. Hmm? Oh, there is one note that I wanted to talk about that I was a little surprised that they did. Uh, did you notice in uh, Thief? where the love story where he was traveling, Ethan was traveling through time, they actually showed him witnessing 9-11. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was interesting and bold because you don't often see that 9-11 really mentioned or shown really at all. So I thought that was very interesting that they, that they went there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So all this time, I think the other, so going back to the writing, Mm -hmm. the other problem I have with how this ended was it means that for all this time, all this protection of Cole and Cassie was irrelevant. It wasn't irrelevant because without Cassie and Cole, the witness isn't born. And without the witness being born, there wouldn't be the army of the 12 monkeys and 
her mother wouldn't have been created or sent back in time. All those events wouldn't have happened if it were like her creation. Yeah, it sounds so like you're, witness, it, hold on. It sounds like you're, something's hitting your mic again. Okay. So in order for Olivia to become the true witness, the false witness needs to be born first because everything centers around him. The creation of the 12, army of the 12 monkeys. Mm -hmm. He's like the catalyst. He's like the first Donro that gets to her. And once he is born and created and she kills him, then her true ascension happens. Her cycle begins, if you will. And she can start setting forth the plan to make sure that she is created and the witness happens. It's a whole big loop. It's a whole big cycle which I think they've been hinting at throughout the series that everything's a cycle. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that this, everything's going to end up into a loop and that nothing really changes, that they really can't change time, that all these events are going to happen because they're meant to happen and there's nothing that can be done about it. That they, they can't save humanity or they can't end the plague or anything like that. They're just chasing their tail like the snake. And so I'm wondering if that's why that image popped up this season. Okay. But I don't know. So the writing, like you said, hasn't made things that clear, so it's, it's a bit muddled. Yeah. I really don't have any other really any significant notes other than talking about Olivia, the false witness and Ethan and just the just the writing and stuff. Uh, I think pretty much everything else was pretty clear. Um, not sure if Jones is gonna make it, but other Do you than think that, we need her in season four? Hmm? Do you think we need her in season four? No, I don't think we need her in season four. Tell me more. Why do you think that? I think her character arc is done. I honestly do. I think that her finding the root cause, finding the witness, and stopping the witness, which in an essence has happened with Ethan, you know, dying, has happened that she's she's done. They can't really time travel anymore because Titan's there to destroy them. There's no one singular point that's going to fix everything. There's no one person for them to uh, stop unless somehow they travel back in time and stop her from happening, uh, Dr. Jones from existing, because then there wouldn't be time travel. But I don't oh, think that's girl, don't happen. give them ideas because you know they might write it so that that's the ultimate goal and that's <laughs> how they end the series. Don't give them that idea. <laughs> and I will be so uh, pissed if they do that. That Hannah will go back in time and kill her own mother. Yeah. I will be yeah, pissed uh, because it's like, so we did four seasons for nothing. Are you serious right now? Yeah, and I... I think what they've been hinting at is with Ethan's storyline, with the fact that he can't see, um, you know, the love of his life dying or her existence, and he couldn't fix it. I mean, he went through all those iterations, and he couldn't stop her from dying at all. That you really can't stop time. If something's meant to happen, like the play keeps being moved up in time. It was supposed to happen one year, then it happens in another year, and now it's happening in 2017 that it's kind of like a, a party, you know, the date and time might change, but the party's going to happen. It's a matter of when and where. And it might end up being like that, which would be very frustrating if this entire time there's nothing can be changed, nothing can be undone, and they're just in a loop. That would be kind of silly, and I would be very mad with the show if that's how it concludes. Because I feel like I've went on this journey for nothing, really. I mean, that's not how time traveling shows are supposed to work, right? Mm, well, they're not supposed to, but... <laughs> Folks write stuff the way they want to write it. Like I said, write your yeah. rules. If you write your rules, I'll follow your rules, but you gotta follow your rules, you know? Yeah, and that was the other thing that annoyed me with, just a little bit that annoyed me with the the 
the season finale was that they now had an army of the the, the, the sisters, uh, or I'm sorry, not the sisters, the daughters, join Katarina and to go after Cassie and Cole. So there's like no limit to who can travel now. And they didn't. Everyone can travel. And it's like, so all those problems you talked about in season one, where you could only travel so many times and only certain people were able to pull it off, that's just out the window. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to get mad all over again. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> this is going to make me mad. This is going to make me so mad. And plus, their uses of paradoxes this, um, this season seem to be a slightly wonky. First with the turtle and then with the watches. Yeah. Because my understanding, they weren't supposed to be using that so much because it could really cause things to go bad. Yeah. The, like, but now, now we're weaponizing paradoxes. Um, so let's talk about moving forward. We think Katarina's done. We know Deacon's moving forward. Uh, Ramsey's doesn't seem to be coming back, and I think that's good. It's like, yeah, people got to die, and can we just let them stay dead? Not that I don't like Ramsey's, but if there's no death or there's no permanence, then there's no point. Um, yeah. Olivia, we know, is coming back. Cassie and Cole, what's their role now? I don't know because they're, I don't think they're the heroes of the this, this show any longer. Were they ever? I think. Well, if you think about it, if they're responsible for the witness and thus responsible for Olivia, too, because they did leave her behind, mm -hmm. they might be the actual true villains of all this, really. Their inactions and bad actions and actions that they have committed has, has really caused all of this. They're, they're the problem, if you can think about it in that sense. So do they make it through this? Well, we know that Cassie dies in 2017. Does Cole make it through this? No, I think Cole has to die. Somehow. He has to die somehow. Whether it's protecting Jennifer or trying to take out Olivia or, of course, trying to protect Cassie. He has to die. And I think they might have even hinted at it when he talked to himself. Because they never went back to that moment. He talked to himself, future self, talked to past self to get him off of finding Cassie, and then Cassie comes up and walks to Hooter, um, Hooter after like he called himself. Because um, for some reason they had to get to that moment, and they never explained why that was. They never went back to that. So maybe he ends up dying somehow. Maybe he hits the button and emotes. I don't know. But I don't think, I don't think anybody really is going to make it except maybe Jennifer. And Hannah. Because I like her. Oh, you think Hannah's going to make it? Yeah, you can't kill Hannah. She's, Why not? I know she's a warrior warrior princess, but she's just so adorable. Han that's really that's exactly why you kill her. <laughs> <laughs> Look, everybody uh, can get it. Everybody can get it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, you know what? If everybody does get it in season four, I wouldn't be upset with it. As long as it makes sense. As long as it makes sense to the story arc and it's not just done for plot's sake. Because, yes, it's important that consequences happen and death has to be on the table, but it, I really didn't like how Ramsey died story-wise. It just, he could have saved him, he could have sent him to the hospital, they could have patched him up, fixed him up. It, I left him somewhere in time or imprisoned him, but I don't, I don't understand it just it just a little irritate me as far as of the, the you know the missteps of this season with his death. Hmm. So overall, what did you think of these three episodes? I would give it a, a nine for acting. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, minus the ending, the story that was told in these last three, I would give an eight. Because it was a beautifully told story. And if I just take the three alone as its own standalone story, it's an eight. As part of the entire series, however, it drops down to a seven. So average nine, seven. Oh, leave it at an eight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, like I said, I I just personally like, like I didn't like the journey getting here, but I just personally like the way the ending and how they're framing it where it's going to be 
Jennifer is a primary versus Olivia. I'm not even sure what exactly Olivia is besides just being the real witness. If she has any special time abilities, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that framing because if the next season, which is the final season, is going to be um, those two against each other, I think that's just exciting because it's something different. You don't often see two women pitted each against each other outside of like some type of really soap or soap opera type of a show. Especially these two characters are pretty well rounded, well defined. They have their own agencies. They're not not typical tropes are tied to them. So I would like to see that just for the sake of something different on television, something that's not often seen happening. And I just hope they they craft it well and take their time with this particular season. This is, is the last season. Hold to on, tell hold, a hold on. Story. You're break. You broke up really bad, and I was having trouble hearing you. Can you say that last part again? Um, I hope that they're able to craft a. The, the story between these two two women, which seems to how they set it up with the way that the, seri the series ended, the season finale, that this the series ending, the, the telling of this story, these two women going at each other, I think, I hope it's well done. Because you don't often see that on television outside of, you know, soap opera type of stuff. And it's, it would be unique, it would be different, and I just hope it's well done. I really do. Because otherwise I'm going to be very very disappointed because whatever goodwill they this show has left with me would be gone. It really would. It would make me upset. But um, overall, I think this last three episodes, I just really like them. I would put them as a nine. But for the whole season, I would have to put the whole season all together, like around seven and a half. I would just maybe put it as an eight. I'd put it, uh, like I said, the acting, all the actors are really good. I enjoy all the actors. They do what they can with what they've been given. So because of that, I would put the season at a, as a six, mostly on the strength of the acting and not the story. Yeah, that's what... It's yeah, hard, what... you know, it's hard, it's hard, right? You have these really talented actors, every one of them, every single one mm -hmm. of them. There's not a weak link amongst them. But then they, they mess up what they're... They don't mess up. The writers mess up what these talented people are being given to do, and it's a struggle. It's a struggle because you're rooting for the actors and, you know, their characters, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, like I said, I just hope that the next season it, they, they fix these, these. They don't take these shortcuts. They don't have these cheat codes. Mm -hmm. they, they pay attention to their mythos, and they, they do a well-crafted story next season. Because otherwise, it is, it's just a wash, and it's one of those television shows that could have been much better if it wasn't for the writing. Because it's not the acting; it really isn't, and it the production adds, is actually pretty good. Yeah, production-wise, I mean, acting-wise, it's not those things. It is strictly on the writers at this point. It's not strictly on the writers at this point, and that's what makes you know it makes it an eight for me. Because, like I said, I just and I might I might come back and downgrade it if it, if season four doesn't turn out to be what I hope it to be because really what it is is, is this hope that I, they gave me a little hope because like I said you don't often see really well crafted female characters that have their own agency they're not fighting each other because of a man or for some other stupid reason that you know that typical you see you know done with them in female characters and have them kind of go out after each other where you have one who's clearly a hero and one who's clearly a villain and they are acting villain they take ownership of their heroic role and their villainous role and they there's no bones or him and hawing about it and kind of going out each other and I, I just see a great potential with that I just hope really that's what the direction is because if it's not then I would have to down I would have to downgrade this to about a seven maybe a six it might even go way lower than that depending how season four turns out that's fair. Yeah. Did you have anything else? I don't have anything else to say. Cool. I am, like I said, I am looking forward to next season. I really am. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and watch. It's the last season. <sighs> I just hope they fix it. I need them to fix it. Like I said, I'm rooting for the actress. So for that alone, I'll watch it. So, 
All right. Well, that's it for season three of 12 Monkeys. Uh, thank you all for listening and joining us. And I guess we'll see you next year if you're only listening to the MTR Network for 12 Monkeys. But if you're listening to our other shows, that's fine. Uh, this should be coming out before Awesome Con. We have Negro Con this weekend. If you're coming, stop by and say hello. I'll be there. Shanna will be there. Uh, Chris and Palm and Jax, who regularly guests and is the creator, the, oh gosh, the composer of the Insanity Chucks theme song. He will be there as well, along with the folks from the Black Guy Who Tips and Where's My 40 Acres and the crew. So stop by and see us. And if you're not, if you didn't get a ticket, I'll be floating around Awesome Con covering it as press. So look me up. Uh, thank you. And we will talk to you next year. Bye. Bye. Bye.